They classify drugs by the body system that is used or by the class of agent it is, um, like the sympathomimetics or whatever they call them, or the mechanism of ac action. So nitroglycerin is a vasodilator. So it's called the cardiac drug because it helps the heart feel better. Um, an antipyretic pyretic is given to reduce fever or epinephrine will close the blood vessels and open the airways, the smooth muscle in the airways. And that's why it opens the airways and breathe better, better and it closes, closes, uh, brings, brings the blood, blood pressure, pressure up, up as it closes the blood vessels for when the anaphylactic shock is coming out with problems. problems. All right. All right. Um, you have two nervous systems, systems sympathetic, sympathetic and parasympathetic. What's the sympathetic, sympathetic system do? Fight or flight. Or flight. Those, Those are the things that happen to your body, body when you are startled and your, your heart starts pumping, pumping and your pupils get bigger and your muscles prepare for fight. fight. The sympathetic, on the other hand, is parasympathetic, parasympathetic is what? Rest, Rest and relax. relax. That's, That's after, after you eat and, and all things go to your digestive system, system and you're just ready to go take a nap somewhere and chill out. Which is why. Um, so, so the blood, the blood is, is in the autonomic, the sympathetic nervous system, the blood's blood going out to your muscles, muscles in your hands, hands shutting down, down your abdominal organs, saying you guys go on hold for a minute. Which is why if you're ever working around cows, cows or horses, horses and they get nervous, first thing they do is what? They pee on them. They're, they're emptying, the they're emptying the body of excess things, things so that they're already ready, ready to run. run. Yeah. When I don't have blood, blood, my sympathetic nervous, nervous system apparently was activated, activated, and my body I said, mm, go throw up, get whatever's in your stomach out, and you shouldn't have eaten it just before donating blood. Remember that for the record. Don't eat just before donating blood. Oh, it did me. <laughs> I ended up on my hands and knees when I tried to get out of it because I felt like I was going to puke. Better to stay there and puke now rather than fine. Um, okay. So drugs that affect the sympathetic nervous system are called sympathomimetics, which would be, for instance, epinephrine. That is, that is why epinephrine gives you the same, same symptoms, symptoms, the shakiness, the beating, the rapidly beating, beating heart, that, that somebody, somebody coming in and, and scaring you, or off. driving down, down the road and narrowly missing, missing that, that elf, elf that just went to cross the road in front of you. And scares you to death, death because, boy, you just narrowly missed dying, and then on the outside, there's a big green, and you run off a little way down. Yeah. So any sympathomimetic will give you those same reactions. Same, same symptoms. symptoms. That's, That's how you how know if they're working right, right. If you know what they do. Um, um, There's a lot of alpha beta, beta responses, responses and what affects the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. system. I, don't I don't know, know that there's that really many, many of those are used. Um, and what we do. If we if run into serious there's a lot, lot of poisons, poisons that those poisons. are needed for those. But then you, then you have, have analgesics and antagonists. An analgesic is something that relieves pain. pain. An antagonist, An antagonist is something that blocks that, that from working. Mm -hmm. so, so if I go out and I take a whole bunch of fentanyl, fentanyl which would normally relieve really pain, pain but instead of so taking it to get high, high you have uh, naloxone that can come, come along and block, block that receptor that and kind of that's, that's an antagonist that blocks it from happening, stops, stops the action. The action. Um, talks, talks about various, various classifications, classifications in the area, and those are known. It's good to know the drugs you give, but beyond that, I don't really have to memorize a bunch. 
of everything. I actually have a niece that's a pharmacist, so it's handy to have a pharmacist friend that you can quick text and say, hey, is this doing? What should I be doing with it? Or you can ask the doctors or nurses. Um, we do play with some. Well, you'll know the, uh, for example, cardiac medicines or a lot of oils. Anything that has glycoprotein or glycoprotein is a, a glucose, glucose controlling medication. They have yeah, channel blockers. blockers. One good thing to know is a beta, beta blocker. blocker. If someone, if someone was on, on a beta, beta blocker, blocker, they are not going to show signs of shock. shock. It stops, it stops their heart from speeding, speeding up. up. So I had, I had a patient, patient that, that I was looking, looking at, and what? what? I saw I it in the house, house I expected her to be going over the shock, shock but her heart rate wasn't was changing. changing. And her blood, her blood pressure, pressure wasn't changing. changing. And I thought, this, this isn't right. The rest of her saying that she's going shock, shock, but this part is not. And it's because she was on a beta blocker. So if you ever find someone on a beta blocker, do not wait for that blood pressure and that heart rate to change because they're not going to. Um, they're stopping them. We all know that we need to ask, ask them what the meds they're on. And be sure and check things like uh, medicines, vitamins, minerals, fluids, electrolytes, a lot of things that would be taking effect in what we're doing. The forms are solid or liquid. Meter dose inhalers are the asthma medications usually, often, not always. The medication patches are your transcutaneous. You have gels, for example, the energetic gels or glucose based stuff that you give them. We talked about the routes. Be sure you give it the correct route. And some drugs absorb really fast and some are slow. Be sure you, you know what you have, have and the epinephrine when you give it. it. Be sure you, you have, have a second, second dose if you have a long transport because it will only last 15 to 20 minutes and that reaction might be struck and come back again. Um, the body, body eliminates, eliminates drugs. It can usually, usually, it gets filtered out by the kidneys and goes through waste products and you pee it out or poop it out. Sometimes, Sometimes it, you can use, get rid of it through sweat baths when you perspire, like, like your, your electrolytes, electrolytes will be kicked out at that point in time. Um, people, people who have, have poor kidneys, kidneys they're in kidney, kidney failure, failure or whatever, whatever they're, they're poorly perfusing, perfusing. you really you have, have to be careful what medication and fluid you give them because you can cause problems there. there. Um, there's a handy chart. chart. Talks, Talks about, about all the factors, factors of drug absorption. absorption. Uh, hmm. Table 12 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, That's a good, a good one, one to know. You don't necessarily have to memorize, memorize it, but read it and know uh, Your special, special populations, we talked talk about that are going to be weird. weird. What groups are always the weird ones and don't react the way they should? Geriatrics, pediatrics. One more, who's always here? Diabetics. Diabetics, Diabetics. you got it. Those, Those are the three that are always weird. weird. When you give them stuff, they react differently. They, they have different signs, the signs, symptoms. They're just weird. Um, some things won't be absorbed properly. Um, medications interact with, with each, each other. other. For example, For example uh, things, things like Viagra, like for erectile dysfunction, dysfunction, dysfunction drugs. drugs. If you mix, mix that, that drops your blood pressure. pressure. If you mix, mix it with nitroglycerin, it can be fatal, especially if you throw alcohol in there. Some people do it recreationally, take it just for kicks and giggles, and they die. So be aware, be aware of that. That, that is something we need to ask before doing nitro. 
if females, females too, too sometimes they put on erectile dysfunction meds for various reasons. Um, if yes, somebody, somebody is overdosed, we need to be able to, to distinguish whether they do this on purpose or they do it on accident. The older people, gee, I can't remember, remember if I took that pill. pill. Should I take it again? again? Should, Should I skip it? Well, I was told not to skip it, so I guess I better take it. it. And they end up having your overdosing or underdosing. So they're so losing their therapeutic effect and they're potentially, potentially becoming toxic over it. Um, so those, so those would, would be an accidental, accidental but, but a non-accidental would be someone who's actually trying to commit suicide. The crazy teenagers that eat a bottle of Tylenol, that's, that's not going to kill them off as fast as they think and they're in for a very miserable time because overdosing on Tylenol is very, very bad on the liver, isn't it? Yep. Okay. A therapeutic index is when the, is the dose you give is the best dose for the most people. An example, example of medications, medications and giving them to people appropriately. We had a guy here intensely who never ever touched pain, pain meds. He didn't take so aspirin, he didn't ever touch anything. anything. And he went in the hospital and they gave him you know, something that was an opioid, like Percocet or something. I don't know exactly which one. The one that reduces your respiratory rate because it was an opioid. And they gave him this medication and then gave him. This, this is a dose for normal adults. Here's some more, some more before, before you go, you go to sleep. sleep. And he went to sleep and never woke up because in his case it was an overdose. So if it's something new, then you might want to be use caution too, especially if you're going into the pain med department. Um, factors that affect these. So age is one that affects it because of the how fast your mobility, your motility, and your GI tract is. Um, that can cause toxic levels. The immature organs can cause toxic levels. Of babies, the body mass. So most medications are given based on patient weight. You'll learn them in so much per kilogram, especially in the little kiddos. The one exception to that is that's an effort, but actually there is a dose that you have to figure out for little kiddos and that there too. Um, the sex. Some of the medications will be different, affect males and females differently. So you might not digest it. I can't think of one right off hand, and it doesn't give you an option. But because we have different compositions of fat, water, and different hormones, they can affect us differently. Environmental conditions, things like the time of day, temperature, and altitude, and even noise can alter a body's response to drugs. I didn't know that. But there are medications, they tell them, take this in the morning and hour before breakfast. Because they want it to be absorbed into the body before the food gets there. I think it's the thyroid medicine. But they tell people that. Um, some patients have a genetic factor going on. The one thing genetic I, that comes to my mind or some, some people, people, because, because of their of genes that they inherited, are more likely like to become an alcoholic, alcoholic over another person. Or some, some drug might affect them differently because of whatever their genes are. Kind of like, like the people that like, like cilantro, cilantro or don't like cilantro. cilantro. It's genetic. It tastes, tastes like soap to me. I hate it. it. Nasty, nasty, nasty. I'll take just a teeny tiny, tiny bit, bit, bit too much, and I can't eat it. Yeah. It's like My chewing soap. soap. Redheads, redheads kick, kick out anesthesia, anesthesia pretty quick. quick. What does? Uh, uh, redheads, redheads are harder, are harder to, to do, do anesthesia, anesthesia with. with. Redheads are harder to put on anesthesia. We had we have, um, a patient recently. recently that was on that, and she, she kept, kept coming out of anesthesia. They were having a heck of a time keeping her sedated because of the meth that was in her system. 
Mental stresses can have negative effects on the entire system and thereby affect the metabolism too. Um, so predictable, predictable response, response is your desired, desired response, response the side effects are not what you want to happen. happen. Goes, Goes back, back into all those words again. People, People can build, build up the tolerance, tolerance to it. it. I had a brother in law that would take the two aspirin for a headache and it did nothing, nothing for him, so he took like 16 instead because that's, that's what it took to control his headaches. But he built up a huge tolerance. Uh, there's a cumulative effect, effect if you keep taking them in the long term, term or take them too close together, together and kind of jump through the whole chapter here and there. Okay. Good, Good luck. Okay. Factors influencing medication and reactions. Okay. That's what I remember. Cumulative effect is when you've been taking them for a long time, time and it can, if you take them too close or too far, it accumulates. Like, just like you know, it's stress from building up a long time, you become very stressed. It's not something one stressor that just happened today. Um, habituation is the term for tolerance of or dependence on drugs. So the term is addiction. And the body gets used to it. And then there are those people that go with, through withdrawals to that drug because the body thinks it needs it and can't do without it. And you get weird symptoms going on. Um, a summation fact is when you have two different, different drugs, drugs that work together. together. Either they play well and well, you put two different drugs together, maybe they play well or they don't. Sometimes, Sometimes when you put two together, you get, get much, much more effect than, than what you would have without. For example, if you were taking iron, iron they tell you to take vitamin C with it because you absorb a lot more of the iron if you're taking vitamin C. So they synergize, they synergize probably, uh, uh, not synergism, they potentiate, they help make it their dose better. better. Synergism, synergism is when the it, it, reaction is bigger, bigger than the one, one, or the sum of the two. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So an so example, example, which one is this? Uh, potentiation. potentiation. Is a potential, a potential thing, thing that could happen, happen that's, that's not, not good. good. For example, For example if they, they take Tylenol and, and alcohol in their act, they, they cause, cause more damage, damage to the liver than it would with one or the, the other. other. The two together, two together cause more liver damage. damage. Okay. okay. Hopefully that makes some, some sense. sense. What are your five breaks? I don't know. I do. Right patient. Right patient. We have 10 rights in A. We have 5 rights in EMT. We have 10 now. Okay. So you have your five, your right patient, right medication, and indication. That's the right thing to give right now. You have the correct dose, right dose, right route. You're not sticking that baby aspirin in his tongue. The right time. Uh, Example of that, when my husband had his knee surgery, he takes, can't think of what it's called, but it's something he takes just once a day, and he takes it at night when he goes to bed, and the dear hospital people insisted he take it in the morning before breakfast, and I was not there to stop it, he tried to tell them, nope, I can't do that, and they made him take it anyway, his blood pressure dropped, and he couldn't walk that day, and he was stuck in the hospital for another day, which delayed his physical therapy, and a whole bunch of things. All because they insisted he take the medication at the wrong time. Um, right patient education. Before you do any bed medicine, if you have time, be sure to explain this is what I'm giving you, this is what it's going to do, this is why I'm giving it to you. Um, kind of like doing the aspirin. I'm giving you this, this is what it's going to do for your heart, this is why I'm giving it to you. So that I know, I know it's going to help that, that the blood get past, get past that clot better, better, and you're going to be able to your pain will lessen because of that. Yeah. Patients, Patients do have, have a right, right to refuse. They don't have, have to, take to take what you're trying to give them. them. They have they a have right. right. You want to make sure, sure they have the right response, response to the medication, medication you gave, and, and you need to 
properly document, 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 document,
questions, questions. on that. Yeah. Like I think there are times there are times you want to read it, times you don't. It'll talk about that when you read about them. Our ambulance only carries normal sailings, so it makes it fairly simple for those of us running with us. Other ambulances only carry activated ringers. There are times that one or the other is better, but something is better than nothing, so. And interestingly, you've got to be careful not to overhydrate somebody. We're going to need this a lot in the next one because you can cause us a problem. But I had a kid that was severely, severely dehydrated. And they actually gave that kid five big bags of normal saline pumped into that kid. I had two in him before I got to the hospital. And I was told to give the third, but I I had run out of time when we were there. That's a lot of fluid. But we that's what we needed to replace. His body was so dehydrated he didn't have the fluid in it. This was a, I think he was like 18. You know, I I checked out the and I went to check out and he said, suddenly I'll come out. He said, I got a pee. And I said, well, I bet you do. <laughs> After drinking all of that, wow. I mean, drinking it, but getting it all in your ID. Um, so there are cases. Burns are one that you take take a whole lot of fluid, but you need to give it. You start out with a big bolus, and then the rest of it you divide, and you give it over the next many hours. So the first 24 hours is a figure that you need to decide what goes here. So if you're questioning, well, I'm not sure how much to give this guy, and I want to fluid it in, or what. You, that's the case. You either look at your Sheet or call medical control, make sure you're doing it right. right. Any questions? Right. Before we jump to the next chapter, do it. Look slowly. Okay, vascular okay, access. access. Brian, Brian just kind of went into that. I didn't cover the background stuff. Yes. yes. Okay, I did not let you guys know when I was beginning of class. Only stupid question is one that's not asked. Right, absolutely. Can I get some practice at home? Because she's a nurse, she can help talk you through it. Yeah. We'll work on that. Yes. I need to get a bunch of catheters. I should have done that when we were there last night. So we have them for you to be trained and practicing the training. training. Um, last, last time we did this class, class, I just asked the volunteers in the community on the Facebook, the, you know, the old 10 Sleep Help page. I said, we need volunteers for people to practice IVs on. And several people saw me and said, did you really get volunteers? I said, yeah, I did. I had several volunteers. Becky, Becky, I already, I already have, have volunteers, volunteers for us, us too. Yeah, so. Medical, Medical people, people that say, hey, yes, I know you need this, go for it. Yeah, yeah I, have I have a few people, people that actually love to do it. Do it so. Cool. <laughs> yeah. My daughter had a friend in high school, high school that loved people starting on this on She had a very good business. I think she just loved it. Sitting there seeing if they could succeed or if they failed. No, no. So, uh -huh, I beat you. I don't know. Okay. That goes on. Yeah, factors affecting your really good games. Um, I beat therapy is the most invasive procedure that we do. There are a few things that will be a little more invasive, but this is not. This is the most invasive we do. Um, the body needs the same homeostasis. What does that mean? Yeah, the body needs to stay home and chill. It's balanced. Everything is in order. All the little chemicals and such, the electrolytes are all there. The fluid is right. 
Most of us actually function dehydrated. I'm one of those people. I usually realize how dehydrated I am just when it's time to go to bed. And so you have a choice of, okay, do I really want to drink all the water? And yep, I'm all right. I'll let you just sleep. And I'll be even more dehydrated in the morning. Um, so yeah, yeah, you're looking for homeostasis. How the amount of fluid that's in your body definitely affects that balance, and that's why you're able to give fluid out in the field. Um, if you administer even my like fluid, inappropriately administered, you can kill people. Give too much to certain people, it will cause fluid to go into their lungs and cause problems and complications. Um, and other people. You what? You do. And so, as it says, any doubt, contact medical control. Obtaining it before you can start. Give drugs. Make sure you have all the rights in order. Obtain an order for medical control. Which, which, especially in these areas, areas we have, have a lot of written protocols because, because there's areas we can't contact medical control. And we're in the middle of nowhere. Make, Make sure, sure you understand, understand the order when the doctor the gives you an order to give this and keep the dose. dose. To make sure you have it correct. Uh, inquire, be sure and ask people, people are you allergic to this? Yes. When I started my first IV, Dr. Miller was having me start on him, and they had the little, uh, the red stuff, the uh, the, That's what they were using to swab and clean the area. And I put that on, and he says, did you ask me if I was allergic to iron? I said, no, are you? And he said, yes. I don't know if he really is or not, but I grabbed out a bottle of swab and clean it off and hurt. So be so sure you ask, ask before you put anything, anything on them or in them, them, them if they're allergic. Um, um, verify you have the proper medication, medication and prescription. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Medication doses, you're not expired. I actually asked medical control once if I should give you expired everything because it was way expired. And they said, yeah, you should give it. Because <laughs> that's all I had. Um, confirm what medications, medications they're taking and be sure you're not going to mix with it. it. When you start on any bed, this one is very interesting. If you look at it, you want it to be clear. I might as well open it. You're going to open it, you're going to look at it, make sure there's no little little things in it. If it is desired, look at heavens, it's only half full. Too. Oh, wait. This one is half gone. gone. In the bag, which says the concentration is way off. And I really don't see floaty things in it, though. It still looks clearer. Um, so, this is what you're checking on before you start fluid on your day. If, if there's, there's any, any solids in there, don't give it to them. them. If it's discolored, don't give it to them. them. If it's expired, don't give it to them. If all I have is a bag of my fluid, 
IV fluid that expired two months ago and they desperately need fluids, I would probably go for it. But if it expired, golly, what, 17 years ago? No, I would not. <laughs> um, so, so but you need to make sure what it looks like. Any medication you want to give, make sure it looks like it's supposed to. Because things look really weird when they get old. There are expiration dates on medication during the COVID time. They had shortages on a bunch of And they actually said, okay, the real expiration date is actually here instead of what we told you, trying to get you to buy more. Um, be sure you get confirmed any incompatible mess. Medications. There are medicines. The reason when we take in people in severe trauma and cardiac and strokes and such, you should have a large bore, big as you can, and be in two of them. You should have two in two separate veins. You can't do the same thing because sometimes they cannot mix this solution with that solution, so it has to go in the body in two different places, or it will form. Uh, that's the word I want. The form little compounds that solidify and fall off, and the medication can't work. Um, what? No, not solids. Precipitants. I don't know. Can't tell you. Um, all, all solutions, solutions have, have a solvent, solvent. That's, that's the fluid, fluid and the solvent, solvent. solvent. that's the stuff that goes into it. Glucagon, I, I haven't have touched in years, years, but I know when my, my son got it, you had, had a little powder, powder thing here, and you had a solution thing here, here, and you had to mix it together and then draw it up and give him the glucagon shot. I don't think it's that way anymore. Yep, that's how it was. Not was several yeah, 20, almost 30 years ago, I guess. They had to mix it. The epinephrine stuff has to come that way too. You get it in two different things and you had to mix it and give it to the person. The powder? Oh, yeah. There's times like when you are giving D50 or D25 or D10, kiddos only get half as much sugar as the adults do. So you can spill out if you're giving the D50 shot things. You dispose of half of it and then you fill it up with normal saline and then you give it to them. So you're not overdosing them. Um, so it talks a lot about how the medicine is taken through the body, the diffusion, we talked about how it goes between the cells. Filtration is an example is in the kidney. It takes things and filters it out and then it lets other things go on through the body and it cleans out all the stuff that shouldn't be there. And gets rid of the body waste products. products. Um, the polarization that uh, we have our cells with the sodium and the potassium are the positive and the minus, and that's what goes back and forth across the membranes, and that's what makes your heart rate and it keeps things moving in the rest of the body and performs the ATP that is the stuff that gives our body energy. Understand, understand is basically how all that works. I don't think you need to have it entirely memorized, but a basic understanding. You know, yeah, that's how that goes across. Because it will explain things like you have fluid compartments, a normal cell. Is this cute little round Do you guys have that picture? We're in table figure 13.5. 
If it gets, it gets too much, much fluid, fluid inside, inside of it and it's not moving out, out, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until it bursts. And, and if it doesn't have enough water, water, it's going to go flat and flat. flat. Kind of like a limestone. If we give you too much air, it's going to balloon up and burst eventually. And if we don't give you enough, they're going to collapse. Or if they have a hole in them and they're losing the air, it will collapse because it doesn't have the air in it. Um, interstitial, well, intravascular is the, the fluids that are inside the veins themselves. Interstitial is out between the cells and the vascular system. And then the intercellular is what's in the cell itself. So you need to understand that fluid is moving from the bloodstream across the space and into the cell. So if you get too much and it ends up, kicks out of the blood and the cells, and it builds up too much in this middle space, the interstitial fluid, you get, um, that's where you get the edema. It's because the fluid's getting kicked out. Of the other two, they're full and they don't need any more, so it gets booted out. And then you have to give them certain medications to get rid of that. It has a picture of hitting the edema on figure 13-7. Is that in yours? Yep. Um, my husband's leg looks just like that every so often. You just go up and poke it, and that little hole sits there. It's like when you make bread. And you go up to poke it to see if it's time to eat it. People don't make bread anymore, do they? Right. <laughs> Some do. Not me. Um, dehydration is the opposite. You can tell. You can pick your scan up like this and it'll stay there. Oh, I'm actually sitting in hydrated today. But it's not very much. It's still dry. It stays. Age also does that. Your skin gets baggy. But, yeah. Mine will stay, stay up, up all the time. time. I'm completely dehydrated. Most people are. And dehydration can cause swelling, swelling in the in feet and legs, legs too. It does. It can. Yeah. It can cause orthostatic, orthostatic hypertension. Who knows what orthostatic hypertension is? Limbs. Okay, drop okay. a blood what pressure when you move. move. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, people with the blood pressure, pressure, I can be sitting here in your chair, chair, and if I get, I get up, up too fast, fast, you get real dizzy, and you start grabbing for whatever's nearest to you, you keep falling over. It happens with dehydration also. also. If you stand up too fast, you don't have enough fluid in your system to get it back up to the head, but it's nice to be that fast, and you get really dizzy. Um, what are other causes, causes of dehydration, dehydration besides, besides not drinking enough? enough. Vomiting, Vomiting, diarrhea, diarrhea flooding, sweating. sweating. Yeah. Sweating, sweating is probably what takes, takes out most of mine. But, but little kiddos, kiddos especially, especially, if they have, have diarrhea or vomiting, vomiting they're going to dehydrate quickly. Because they don't, they have, don't have that much fluid to begin with. Infections, infections bleeding, bleeding out, out trauma. trauma. The thing, the thing about, about Bleeding out, out because, because we don't carry blood, blood products, products. We don't give more than about one of these. Because, because you're, you're doing two things. things. You're watering Water down what's there, there, and they still don't want blood, blood cells, cells to carry the oxygen where it needs to go. And you can actually give them too much, too much, and it will break the clots that are trying to form and stop the bleeding. So you need to be careful not to overhydrate them. Yes, they do need fluid. Which is why when I first started, we kept the blood pressure up to normal. And now you have something called permissive hypertension. If somebody's bleeding out, I'm fine. <laughs> if somebody is bleeding out, um, you're going to keep their blood pressure at least 90. That's what you're shooting, 80 to 90 now instead of the 120 or whatever you used to do. And it's okay, it's okay and I know that's enough to perfuse the body, so that's what we're aiming at, because we don't want to cause the overflow and cause problems. Um, types of solutions. Oh, what kind of symptoms do you get when your body's overhydrated? You can sleep out of the, the swelling. You can. 
Okay. The back steps under the lungs, you should find people that can't breathe. breathe. What are they going to sound like when you listen to them? Correcting. Correcting. They sound like a prayer when you hear the bubbles. Yeah, they're wet. Those are called rails. Those rails are the rails in the deep blue sea. So when you hear the crackly, crackly wet sounds, sound that's what it's called. They get they all puffy, puffy their eyes get puffy, their face can get puffy. puffy. Um, they, they can cause your heart, 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 heart What was that? It can, it can cause, cause your heart, heart to uh, not, not be able to pump, pump properly either. either. Right, your right, heart, heart can't pump properly because it's changing the pressures around it. You get excessive urination. Yeah, and causes, causes of this can be in the long run. I started July. I was thinking of bolus of 200, 200 or outside, outside track over here, here. And by the time I got back, I read it. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Some fairly healthy, healthy people, people, that doesn't make a difference. But if they're not really healthy, that can make a big difference. Kidney failure. Or people that have prolonged hypoventilation. It means they're not breathing adequately. So their lungs aren't working as they should. So your composition, composition is your crystalloid solution of what we give. It's the saline and the lactated ringers. Get the stuff sort of diluted into it. The colloid solutions have bigger molecules in them. And, and often, often they're too big to pass capillary membranes, so they stay in the blood, blood in the vascular, vascular system longer because they can't get out. out. Um, you have your, your isotonic, which is, is so chloride and lactated ringers. Your hypotonic is D5W, w. and the hypertonic are things like blood products and now that stay in the blood vessels and fill them up. So that you can keep the volume. Um, keep, keep in mind, mind your isotonic, isotonic solutions, solutions don't, don't have the have capacity, capacity to carry, carry oxygen. oxygen. They can't they help them maintain diffusion. So this, so this is where we treat with, with high flow two and high flow diesel. diesel. Remember, we need to keep transport, transport these people quickly the way they can get the help they need. I'm okay. okay. We're still not ready for break. We're about to get through this quick. Sort of. So, so when you when go you to start, start your IVs, IVs. First, first thing you want to do is assemble all of your equipment. equipment. Make sure you have everything you need. You need, you need to have, have gloves, gloves on every time you start an IV. If you're starting them on multiple patients, you get something on the glove, you're going to change your gloves. Preferably, if the ER docs can wash their hands in between, the rest of us don't have that luxury. Um, make sure you have your restricting band. The elastic ones, I've seen some that are like Velcro, you just kind of suck it up tight and stick it to the side. Blood pressure cuff work. Um, you can put a blood pressure cuff on and pump it up to the pressure you need. You don't need to make them super restrictive if that actually causes problems that are too restrictive. Make sure you have an antiseptic wipe or solution, whatever it is you're told to use. We just carry a normal alcohol wipe. Have some gauze handy to help clean up any blood that escapes. Get your tape before you start to tear your tape so it's ready to use. And you're not trying to fumble and keep that in place and get tape cut torn at the same time. Make sure you have an appropriate IV catheter. Generally, in the MS, you want the largest that will sort of fit inside the vein you're going for. That's not going to make a uh, burst. That's not the word. Yeah, they say the vein blue. Vein blue on me, it just exploded. Um, especially if you're giving medications like D50, you need a pretty good sized needle. D50, you want to be sure, sure it is an absolutely full free-flowing and not anything leaking back because D50 is highly corrosive to the tissue surrounding it. 
So if it leaks out of the blood vessel and into the tissue, it's going to eat, make these really ugly wounds. If you ever want to see some really ugly really wounds, Google it sometime. What D50 wounds look like? They're ugly, which is why the diabetic people, after dealing with diabetes for 30 years, they found out we were giving D50, and they said, no, 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 never. And they said, if it's that hard outside, outside the blood vessels, what do you think it's doing to your blood vessels? So they recommended the D10, which I happily switched to when they had the D50 shortage, and haven't gone back. My auntie's have questioned me, and that's why. Um, make sure you have your extension set. Building. Um, I would grab some of it. What? Without the kit, our kids next to This is a use that we've played with already, so it's, yeah, open it. Tubing set comes, there's a number on it, and that's how many drops per second it can flow through it. So if it's 20, it's going to get 20 drops or milliliters per second. A drop is equal to a milliliter or a centimeter. If you are giving to a little kiddo, you want one that's going to give just very few drops. No, teeny tiny drops. So if there's like 40 drops, I'm wrong. The drops are all the same size. If it's 20 drops, it's 20 drops to a milliliter because it's reduced it. There's, There's one sort of 40, 40 to use for the little kiddos, kiddos because it takes 40 little teeny tiny drops to equal one big drop or one milliliter. And that way you don't overdose them as easily if you're giving teeny tiny drops. It doesn't work very good on people because they need a lot of fluid faster than what that little teeny tube can give. Which is why you want the biggest catheter because you want stuff to be able to flow through it. The smaller they get, the harder it is to get anything through. Especially if you're drawing blood. You get down there in the tiny sizes and it's really hard. It uh, hemolyzes or ruptures the blood vessels as you pull them out, the blood cells, as you're trying to suck it through them. Okay. When you're picking which solution you want to use, ask yourself what the patient's condition is. Are they really critical or are they stable? Does this person really need fluid in Not everybody who pick up needs it. Sometimes, Sometimes we go ahead and start the IV and just put a little cap thing on it or a little extension tubes and clip it off. And we don't give them fluid at all. We just start it so that when we get there, they have access. Things like um, heart attacks and strokes and things that are going to bleeding out trauma, if they're going to deteriorate, you want to get them in as soon as you can because by the time you get to the hospital, they may not be able to get it. On the other hand, there's times I pick people up in the cold and their blood vessels are teeny tiny and I spend the time warming them up and they get nice and plump. And by the time I get them over there, they say, oh, I don't see why you had a problem with this vein. Look at this. Well, it didn't look like that. <laughs> That's why I had a problem. Um, so you're gonna spike your bag. To spike the bag, you're going to yank this cute little blue thing off. You're going to take the cover off this where the big old needle is, and you're going to shove it up in. This wasn't what you found under the trolley, was it? Okay. You're going to shove that up in. And then you're going to squeeze it a little, and it's going to fill this chamber. This is called the drip chamber. And you want it about that much full so you can see the drips going down. And you can tell how fast it's flowing by how fast it's going into there. If you see this filling up, you're giving it faster than your IV needle or whatever can handle. If you accidentally get it too full, you can take your bag this way and squeeze it and it will put fluid back in and bring air into this. You might have to squeeze it a couple times because only so much goes in for a squeeze. So you want to keep it down here because if it's clear up here, you can't see drips. And if it's clear down there, you can't really see drips very well either. So you want something in the middle. Um, you're going to just shove it up in there. Then you're going to hang that up high somewhere. These little gadgies lock off the fluid. If it's down here at the bottom where there's lots of room, you can see it's moving. It's not locked at all. To slow it down, you're going to slowly roll it. 
and to shut it off completely, you're gonna put it clear all the way to the bottom and tighten it. These little things can do the same thing. Uh, that one can't, yep, yeah, can. You're gonna just push that up to where it's pinched off. Little guy. You can push it down to let it flow or all the way open. That's, I like these because I like, I can control them better. You have, your tubing is gonna have an extra port that you can give medication through. And this, golly, look at that undid it nice and tight. This is going to screw on to your IV catheter that you stick in there. On. So you wanna keep that absolutely clean until you're ready to use it. Well, this is full of fun stuff. That white stuff in it. Don't know why. Where it was threaded, the cap's totally full. It's probably the saline. Yeah, the saline because it got left in there when we started IVs. So you want to keep that sterile before you attach it to them. You cannot let it fall down on the floor or such. You don't want to be introducing any pathogen directly into their veins. That would be very frowned on. Once you have everything assembled, your spiked your bag, you have it ready. You're going to apply your restricted band. It's, you're going to kind of pull it up tight, wrap it the other way, and you tuck it this direction so that the tail's sticking out away from where you're sticking the needle. Because if it's going down the way I always do it, it's in my way. So you want it up, so you just pull it up to release it. I can tell you that, and I do it wrong most of the time. <laughs> um, Selecting, where was that? I don't see it right now at the moment. You're gonna select your vein. You want a vein that's nice and round. You want a vein that doesn't have all the cute little, uh, like right here where you can see the big things sticking out. You can tell where the valves are. You wanna avoid those. Old veins start getting more and more squiggly and more and more a lot of more of the valves because it's taken more to keep that blood pushing up through so it makes a mess and then gets harder to do um you want to be careful you don't get your pressure too tight especially on older people i discovered this myself and the book says it would have saved me a lot if i'd read this book sometimes if you go to puncture a vein in an old person and the pressure is too high, the vein will blow, it will burst. Mm -hmm. And I tried it on some enough people that I said, now wait a minute. And I look at their vein and I say, I don't need that. So you may not even need the, the restrictive bandage to make keep the pressure up so the vein pops up. If you look at it, I am dehydrated, but this vein right here, you should be able to hit without a restrictive bandage at all. I don't think it's going to blow on you if you put a bandage on it, but elderly people, it can just blow for no reason. Kicks and giggles. Um, if you go to a place, street smarts, I like their helpful hands. Allow the arm or the hand to dangle off the stretcher to let the blood fill and flow into it better. If you can't find a vein, you can pat it like this. And it helps puff these veins up. They all say, Ooh. you can um, put hot packs on them. Like I said, when they're cold, they get really small. When you put hot packs, they open up to let the heat get, and it gives you the blood vessels better. I see they do that now when you go to donate blood, they have the cute little things mm -hmm. to take your blood. If you meet resistance from a valve, this is a curious thing. I never heard this one. Elevate the arm and it will help open it and help you get it through that. Because I had Nicole start an IV for me on our last run as my student riding on board, by the way, keep track of all ambulance calls you do now. All of you, anytime you're on an ambulance call, please keep track of the hours you did. You have a chart somewhere I gave you or I should have given you. It has patient contacts. Looks like this fun little thing.
So whenever you go on a run, you're going to say the patient's age, gender, the chief complaint. Keep track of the time because you need to be doing, I can't remember how many hours and ambulance ride-alongs count a lot. So keep track of how many patients you find. What? When it's your job? Oh no, driving doesn't count. Although it would count for part of your, what you guys are doing is the assessment. They want you to do the more advanced assessment on people. Mm -hmm. So if you're the one that actually does the assessment on them, yeah, put it down that you did the assessment. And then they get, whoever's observing you needs to write down your rating, what they thought of you and what they. Hey, what, Becky. Yes. Did, uh, Philip contact you about letting people ride on the ambulance? Um, I talked to him about a week ago. Okay. I just know he put an email out saying that you guys would probably uh, be doing that. Yeah. He said, he said he'd get a hold of the state to find out insurance stuff, who covers you, and then get back to me on it. And I haven't heard. So good. So they're good to go anytime. Yeah, um, I'll send him a message and tell him to make sure he checked into that. Okay. Um, ER time. I am working on Worland. I'm not going to send you off to the ERs until probably next month. So I happened to get that class scheduled last week. I had the CEO that called me to find out what I was doing and wanted to know if it was a good use of the facility. It didn't take much to convince him when I said, well, if you wouldn't have put him on call, we wouldn't be there. Oh, who's your instructor? Um, so I said, well, I have you. He says, well, Banner has their requirements. And I said, good, yes, I know. Start finding out what the hoops are we need to jump through so we have time to jump through them. Sometimes they might, I've known them to require things like flu shot. Um, I've had them be required to go take their HIPAA training, which I think is silly because we're under the same HIPAA they are, but sometimes that's required. Um, back to the handy IV, unless someone else had anything else to throw in there. But thank you for throwing that out there. It's good to know that he told you guys it would be coming. Try and elevate the extreme. Oh, after two misses, if you miss twice, let somebody else do it. Unless it is absolutely life essential, in which case you're going to go to the IO and you're not going to mess with it any more than two tries. Um, this was interesting. People with dark skin use betadine or iodine wipes because it makes their veins more visible. One I've been curious about are people that have the full sleeve color tattoos. Good luck seeing any vein on them. I've tried. You're going to have to palpate it. She told you about the little squishiness when you find the vein. Um, It does say, without try without a restricting ban, especially in the geriatric patients, if you can, because it infiltrating, that's what they call it. The official term is infiltrate. It gets out of the blood vessel. And as I said, when she was playing with it, when you're messing with the catheter and you pull that, start pulling that needle back, never, never, never put the needle back in because it can shear off pieces of that plastic catheter and it will take off through their veins and it can become an emboli and can cause things like strokes and heart attacks and uh, pulmonary embolisms and kill them. Don't say oops. <laughs> and panic people. But never pull that back over in real life. You can do it with an IV arm. I don't care. I don't care if you get a piece of plastic floating around. But in person, don't do it. The more IVs you start, the more you get. I actually took the little catheters home and I was going to, I convinced all of my children and my husband that I got one try and they all gave me one try and I failed on all of them. And then my oldest son came home and I told him I was gonna, I had one try, he was at college. 
And his eyes got about, oh, he thought I was kidding. And he sat down and gave me his arm and said, hi, and I pulled out the needle and his eyes got about this big, but I got him. So I had to pray of all the others before I could hit that one. Um, my husband has not very good veins, in my opinion. I have a son who has gorgeous veins. You could teach anatomy, just like wherever that picture is in here. Uh, figure 13, 12. My son's veins stick up like that, like the picture he had, 13, 13. They're gorgeous. But I tried one day to just push on the top, to pinch off the flow to see if it would, you know, get bigger. You can watch them grow if you shut off the, where the flow is going. I could not get his veins pinned down. Those suckers went all over. And my finger could not make it stand still. So you do have people with what we call rolling veins. They are harder than heck to catch. One way you can kind of catch them. I don't know if you can see. Probably not. I can't get my arm that way. I don't see. Well, I got one here. Where it bifurcates, it comes up and it splits. Or... If you go in right above the split into a vein, sometimes that bifurcation keeps it anchored a little better because you have a blood vessel that's going the other direction and it helps hold it still. You can pull a little bit of traction on it, very lightly pull down, but it also makes your vein go flat faster. So you want to use that judiciously. You can, you could hold the hand veins in place. If you look at 13, 14, where they take that hand and crank it down, do that with little kiddos. They say you can just take their hand and mush it clear down against their their wrist, the babies. And they also say you put a flashlight in there and then bend it down and you can see all those veins. And it helps you get an IV in a baby. Put a flashlight in it. Yeah. They're not too fat. Um, so the cat after you're going to start it down in, like she said, make sure the bevel is pointed up when you enter into the vein. A neat trick, as soon as you enter into it, turn it like a quarter of a turn so you're not going to jab out the backside as easily. Because it was sharp enough to go into here, and it'll still stay sharp enough to go right on through if you're not careful. First IV I tried in the ambulance. I was just ready to put the needle in, and we hit a big old pothole, and it went right through the vein. So you got to be, be sure your hand is anchored well, and when you hit the bump, it goes with it instead of the plow like I did. Um, people who have a lot of, take a lot of, uh, okay, there it is. The vein, you want to find one that's firm, round in appearance, or springy when you palpate it. Avoid areas that cross over joints. So like through here, you wouldn't want to try and get there. You need to get it up here on the flat spot. Also, Sorry, you can't see. You don't want to be getting them here. You want to get up on here. Sometimes they absolutely have to go into somewhere like that, though, if that's all they can find on a person. Um, one trick, if you can't find anything here and you can't see anything here, you can try twisting the arm and looking at the back of it. And sometimes people have beautiful veins there. Example of that, anybody who runs into guard, Ferguson, you try, he's got a vein right here that looks really beautiful but he can just twist his hand just a teeny bit and it vanishes which he did on purpose on me and I was ready to slap him but if you crank his arm this way he has beautiful veins right there and you can hit him um, ideally you want to start oh do you know what a dialysis fistula is has anybody seen one People who are going into dialysis, they sometimes take right here in their arms, yeah, right here, they take and cut a vein and an artery and they sew them together. And it makes a big old thing that looks about that big sticking up out of their arm. And you can feel it and it's just under pressure, just flowing both directions at the same time, swirling. Um, do not ever try to poke into one of those. You don't want to hit a artery either. Make sure there's no pulse in it before you stick it in if you're in an iffy area. So like wherever it went, right in here somewhere. I don't know if you can see it. I have a little bump there. And you can actually see it pulsing. Don't ever try to stick anything in that little bump. 
<laughs> it pops up. Oh, look, there's a handy spot, but no, it's got faults. Don't do it. Um, yeah. Although if they ever need my blood gases, right there, you got it. Easy to find. We don't do blood gases. That's, we let the, uh, yeah, other people. People will be higher than our pay grade. You need a break now? Oh, go ahead. Um, avoid anything that looks like it's infected. If there's a bunch of red rash right here and it's hot to the touch, don't do an IV through it because you're gonna be po poking that in. Burn areas, you wanna try and avoid the burns. But if you have someone who's so badly burned, you don't have that option, you're going into the bone and you're doing the IO because that's all you got to go with. Um, people with a mastectomy or lymph node dissection, avoid that air, that arm on that side. If they have it both sides, you just gotta kind of do the best you can. You can go to the top of the foot and actually start it to be there. They don't like it as much because they're more likely to get air emboli in there in between and build up emboli as they come up. If somebody has a whole bunch of track marks, it's usually because they've been punctured a whole bunch of times, whether it's because of drug use or somebody who donates blood a whole lot will get track marks in certain parts of the blood vessel. And it starts to sclerosis and build up and harden. So you don't want to go through that place. Uh-huh, she's showing me hers from donating blood so much. I had a medic that hopped on board with me and he said, oh, good, give me the IO kit. I said, oh, but look at those good veins. He says, uh-uh, too tracked up, give me the IO kit. So I gave him the IO kit and said, can I at least try? And he said, good luck. And he's right, I couldn't get it. And we needed the IO. This was someone who has been in a car wreck, was very seriously injured, unconscious, didn't care what we did to him. He was totally unconscious and out of it. Um, I talked to you about picking your catheter. Words of wisdom, you can use blood pressure cuffs. There's all kinds of pictures. If you're drawing blood, you start the IV, you take the needle out. Usually there's a little button you push to retract it. Sometimes you just push it forward until it locks and it locks the needle inside of a little clear case so that it's not sticking out. So be really careful with them and dispose of them in a sharps container right away. Don't leave them laying around. Um, and as you take that off, you're gonna put your finger at the end of the catheter and put pressure so that it's not gonna bleed out while you have it unhooked. You can put a cap on it or you can just put your, we just use a syringe to draw blood. So we just screw the syringe on and then you pull, draw the syringe back and it fills up with blood. And then we again close it off and hook it up to your ID for that to it. We usually use something in between, but we don't usually go straight. Just make so sure you take straight. the blood before you put any fluid in. You want to take the blood before you put the flush in. If you use a saline flush or put fluid in it, it's going to dilute it down and not give you real accurate information. So you want to drop first. Some people. Um, especially those who are using recreational drugs might get really huffy with us about drawing blood. Be sure they understand, I am not taking this for a drug test. I am taking this so that we know how to treat you better when we get to the hospital. And if I don't take it now, they're going to take it then anyway. Sometimes it's best to get it in the beginning too, so they can compare it. Because if there's something, there's things that build up as conditions get worse. Sorry, Becky, to interrupt one more thing. Make sure you yes, mark it, the time and the date. Yep. When you draw blood, you're going to fill the tubes. Sometimes people put, if you go to a blood draw, they have that little tube that they put the needle in you, and then they just push the tubes in and out. And the tubes are under vacuum. They fill up. Um, we draw it up in the syringe, and then we put the little thing on it and then do it in the syringe. Um, some your partner can help you do that. After you fill the tubes, you need to shake them back and forth a few times, turn them, invert them, turn them upside down a few times, stick them in a bag. We put it back in the little bag that we have our kits in, write their name, the time you drew it, and your name so that they know what they get when they get at the hospital. Um, 
Some people aren't real good at drawing blood, so they aren't excited to take the blood they drew until they get better at it. Then you're going to tape that, that IV down. We take little tegaderms in the out in EMS. We usually put the tegaderm down first because our tape is less sterile than what's in the hospital. In the hospital, they tape it first and then put the tegaderm on sometimes. You're going to tear a little strip about see, that long. And if it's you're using tape that's an inch wide, you want to tear it in half lengthwise, so it's about half an inch. You're going to stick it under the catheter, and you're going to come up above on the one side and then wrap the other end on the other side. So you're making a V. There's a lovely picture, sort of. Uh, figure 1322. You can't see the other side of the V, but if you do that V going this way, it helps keep it anchored so it's not going to pull out. And the faster you get that done, the better, because you never know when you're going to hit a bump and you're going to lose if somebody's holding the tubing or they yank at it and pull it out. Then you're going to bomb proof it. You're going to turn the tubing up and you're going to put a big piece across it. You might put two or three pieces. I used to turn it up and then turn around and let it go the other way and have it taped several places because you don't want it to come loose as you're bouncing down the road. What was that? Yeah. We got her. I, I must admit, I was playing with the tubes and not watching as she taped it down. And it didn't get anchored correctly, so it had. The tegaderm was on it, but the tegaderm is not super solid. There's another kind, uh, vacutainer. That's the thing, the gadget that you use in between. Tegaderms are on scale rail three dash two. Step three are the tegaderms. The little one on the right hand side that's just the rectangle of clear stuff isn't going to stay as well as the ones that have the white sticky stuff on the outside that's on the left. So I handed the nurse the right-sided one and she said, uh -uh, give me the other one. And I had to go back in and get that one because that's what I was used to using. Again, be sure and dispose of uh, with sharps. You wanna look for any, it's called infiltration. If you go to flush it and you see the skin go and start bubbling up immediately, that means it's going outside of the vein. And it won't do any good to use it. You have to take the needle, the catheter out, put pressure on it, and then wrap it to hold that in place. If, um, so that's one thing you'd have to take care of. They show in figure 1326 where they actually were sticking an IV needle in the jugular vein. I hope to never do that. Uh, babies, they'll actually use veins in their head, little tiny newborns. I hope to never do that. Yep, because it's going toward the heart. Veins go toward the heart. So that's the direction you go. If you ever IV a calf, that's exactly what you're doing. There's veins right here in this little groove, and you lay them down. And I have a hard time because their skin is a whole lot thicker than ours. Um, Saline locks are just a little cap you put on and it will maintain it. Or you can, you know, locks are what show them off. It's all right. Way to maintain the site without actively putting fluid in. Okay, so they have this little tube that's a little bit longer and it can start to close off up there and not down there because you don't want it. Um, It'll occlude itself if you don't keep an eye on it, which is why we don't usually shut the IV fluid totally off. We put it to what's called TKO, which is about 10 drips a minute is all. So that's when you really want to see that drip thing because you only want to count, okay, very slowly, drip, drip. And that's just keeping it open so that it doesn't occlude. Otherwise they have to, yep. Yeah flush it again or sometimes replace it. Uh, complications. Infiltrations when it escapes out of the blood vessel. You can get thrombophlebitis, which is an inflammation inside the vein. It's not usually seen with a pre-hospital patient, but you can get it in people who have long-term IVs in, which is why they will, if you're in the hospital a long time, they take them out and put them in somewhere else. 
occlusions when it gets blocked. Um, why we maintain the drip rate. Hematoma, you can get a big old blood bump going on. The poor guy that I hit the pothole, you can see a picture of a hematoma on 1328. It's always fun to go pick up the patients and say, I just got out of the hospital yesterday and you're looking for veins and that's what you get. The big purple spots. You can't go in that and start an IV. Um, you can cause nerve tendon or ligament damage. Sometimes, I don't know why, you start an IV and it's free flowing and yet it causes a lot of pain. If it's causing pain, shut it off. If you get any bad reaction, shut it off. If you need to pull it out, put your gauze over it, untape everything and pull it out and keep pressure on it. If you accidentally hit an artery, you're gonna be holding pressure, direct pressure for at least 15 minutes until it gets controlled. Um, you can find people with allergic reactions. They get the usual symptoms, shortness of breath, itching, hives, anaphylaxis. They can start wheezing on you. You can get, you want to, when you start your tubing, after you puncture this up in, you're gonna open it up and you're gonna watch the tubing till all the cute little air, air bubbles get out because you can get an air emboli in there and that can kill people too. The tubing, if you have just a teeny tiny spot, you can see a little teeny tiny, this is actually the fluid, but if it was, I was running fluid through it, that would be the air. It's just the tiny spot. It's not as big as it looks because the tubing magnifies it. So it looks bigger, but still try to get all the bubbles out and then close it off and then you're ready to go ahead and start the IV and set it up. If you're using one of those extensions, you got to flush it first so you're not pushing any air in there first. Um, saline flushes have a little bit of air in them. Hold it upright, squirt the air out, and then put it in. Or be sure you're holding it pretty straight up and down when you're putting it in so you're not putting any air in. Be careful of overfluidating them. It says most healthy adults can handle as much as two to three extra liters of fluid without compromise. Uh, problems occur, they start having cardiac pulmonary or renal dysfunction. And people that have any of those problems, cardiac problems, pulmonary problems, they won't handle fluid very well, so don't give them as much. Usually before I give anybody fluid, I have them stick their tongue out and look at it to see how dehydrated they are, especially if it's medical because they'll be white. Um, oh, somebody going outside. I see somebody moving and I'm not finding it. <laughs> it's a shadow coming from out in the hall. They can actually have cracks. They have like a white coated surface on top when they get dry. Start looking at people's tongues or yours when you're really super thirsty, go look at it in the mirror. Um, little kiddos, babies, you can tell because they're they get sunk in up here when they get dehydrated, their soft spot will sink. Um, if your patient starts to exhibit ex, uh, any problems with their breathing suddenly, suspect you have an air and blood going on, they'll get cyanotic or get symptoms of shock. Um, place them on their left side with their head down. It says that traps any air in the right atrium so that it can't get out. And it can just kind of hang out there and not cause problems going through the rest of their system. I talked about catheter shear. Sometimes you get a vasovagal reaction. So you'll see a deep drop in blood pressure or in heart rate. One time a nurse started an IV on my daughter. And she's sitting there going, ow, ow, ow. Thought, ow. We thought she was kidding us. And she kept saying, ow, ow, it hurts. So I finally said, okay, rate that on a one to scale of one to 10. And she said, seven. And the nurse and I both went, oh, that IV came out. <laughs> Cause it, whatever it was, it was causing pain. Uh, the interosseous, we could send to that, it shows you pictures of the bones and exactly what it you're going into. We talked about where you push them. You do not use sternal 
intraosseous, that's a special needle thing. And most people, we do not do that. So don't do that one. They have the IO guns. There's pictures of that in figure 34, 35. I bought a gun that was supposed to be a training, just like the easy IO, but it, you can, it goes too fast. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to make it so you can only pull the trigger so far and you can't pull it any faster because I, they went zip and it went clear through the pad and into the bone and of the, I, the practice bone. It wasn't a real person. What we used to do was figure 36, 1336, these cute little things with a handle. You would push that down into the bone. You'd put some pressure on it and you just sit there and go twist, 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 twist till you felt it go pop into the bone. And if the bone's too hard, it bends the point off the needle. Yeah, it was icky. It was scary, but the IO is, it's a breeze. You just, and it's in. When doing an IO, there are different needle lengths. If you look at the picture in 13.3, table 13.3, you see multiple black lines on it. You're going to take that needle and push it to the bone. And you want to see at least two black lines before you punch the handle and put it in. If you don't see two black lines, it's too short. Save yourself time and don't pain on them by puncturing them twice and get a bigger, a longer needle. Ideally, when you're done, you're going to have that flush with the uh, down, it's going to just flush down on it. If you have to, and you don't have something you can do like the 45 that has the longer one, and you can just suck it down in and not, it's not going to be tight against the skin, but you're going to have to figure out how to stabilize that because it's um, easier to stabilize. But the other thing, there is an injection gun that's spring loaded and it just kind of goes shoot into there. I hear they're more likely to fracture, cause fractures or cracks. When they go in, the I.O. where it's drilling doesn't. Um, so they show you about that and how to find the locations. Ignore the chest one. I've not heard anybody say that's a good plan. And that's pretty well, oh, volume. I didn't get into that. Your medication and drip rates and all that stuff. I should. Let's take a quick break. Well, no. Look through those. These, um, you need to be able to do the volume conversions and your medication drips. Um, for example, more of the drip rates, what you're doing. If you're given like point something per kilogram, remember a pound is 2.2 .2 pounds equals a kilogram. So if you're having to go from one to the other, have a calculator. It's a handy thing about phones, they all have calculators. Double check, make sure you have it correct so you're not given too much medicine. If you don't have, I mean, if they're able to talk to you, ask them how much they weigh. Don't just guess. Because some people can surprise you weighing a whole lot more than you think they will, and other people weigh less than you think they will. And that's what got people in Colorado when they were given ketamine. The police were saying, hurry, hurry, hit him with ketamine and calm him down because he was trying to eat them and throwing them around, and they were trying to restrain the guy. So they came running up, and they gave him the dose of ketamine, and they way over guessed his weight, and it killed the guy. So you need to be sure you're close to what they actually weigh. In the hospital, they have handy dandy beds and they just measure them, but we don't have that luxury. We can ask people around and might know, and then we might have to just guess. The drip rates. You're going to, on um, where's your calculating drip rates at? Right after converting pounds to kilograms. What's where? 624? 624. Um, the GTT is your drip, how many drips your tubing is giving. So if my number on it says 20, 
That number is 20. And do you need to know you're giving 250 milliliters over 90 minutes. So you need to times it by in the 20, it would be 20 drips per milliliter. And by the time you times those two numbers, you get how much you're supposed to be giving them per minute. So you know how many drips you want coming down. So that is one calculation you'll probably have to do. And when you're giving medicine, well, the drip calculation, if you take the volume you're giving over the time in minutes, Oh, volume times drip set over time will tell you how many drops per minute. That's the easier way to look at it, in my opinion. Um, then when you're given a desired dose and determine how much volume goes in, you're giving 12 and a half grams of dextrose and it comes 25 grams per 50 milliliters. You're only going to give them 25 milliliters because your 12 and a half is exactly half of 25. This is the example they give you there. So you need your desired dose divided by the concentration in hand, and that's how much you're going to give them. And you figure out how many milligrams you need. And then you have to figure it out if you have one in a thousand or one in 10,000, how much you're going to have to give them. So there's some examples there. If that doesn't make sense to you when we meet for the test, be sure we go over a few calculations first. If it doesn't. Yes, that's part of the um, uh, Sakamoto skills is you have to be able to do all that and they don't let you take your phone in. It is part of the Sakamoto skills or are you asking if it yes. is? Yes, it is. Okay. Then you have to convert all this stuff. It will be written to, on the written test too. Yeah, I had to I had to do it all. And that's one thing they failed me on is uh not being able to do the division and everything in my head. In your head? Yes. They gave you simple they give you calculations they like give you a, and a half. They do give you a piece of paper and a pen. But yeah, I was nervous and I screwed that all up. Hmm. Okay, so we're going to be playing with that more. I'll throw them out, out at you in class when I'm more alert and more awake and ready. Um, talks about how to give rectal administration, how to give uh, shots. These little glass vials, I have you. Do you guys carry any of those little glass vials anymore? Yeah. They used to have little glass tubes that had a little pointy on top. There's a picture, figure 1345. You got to drop so you don't have the glass in it. Yeah, they mostly have gone to like 46 that where you just take the top off, wipe it with alcohol and draw up what you need. Put air in it as you draw it out or you're going to create a vacuum and not be able to draw it out. Um, talks about safeties. There's the cute little vials that you squish together and mix it together. That's not someone we'll be giving. If you're giving IM administration, one that they like to do, at least the one we were trained on is right here. You just kind of feel it and just go in up there. You put the needle in, you're going to draw back and make sure you don't have any blood because if you have blood that says you're in a blood vessel and you're in an IV, basically, you don't want to do that. Make sure you don't have blood, and then you just go ahead and give them the medicine. Rub it when you pull it you out. Um, when you do a shot, you're going straight in at 90 degrees. When you start an IO, you're going straight in at 90 degrees. 
from the skin. Um, they're now getting more and more meds that go in the mucosa membrane. So they have these little atomizer devices, figure 1354. You draw it up with your syringe and you screw that little thing on the end, the little cone thing. And as you push it through that, it's just gonna mist it. Put whatever the medication is in your mist. So you put it in their nose and mist it, which is what your Narcan is. It's going through something and being squirted and misted into their nose. Uh, figure 1356 is a expansion chamber for the meter dose inhaler, if you've never seen one. They're really, really cool, and I don't know why they don't give them to everybody. Because what it makes, if you go to do the meter dose inhaler and it shoots back really fast and hits the back of the throat, any medicine that hits the mouth is going to stay there, and you need it to go in the lungs. So if you have this expansion thing, you squirt it and it goes into the chamber where it just sits. And every time they breathe in, they're inhaling it into their lungs and it's getting pushed. So they use it a lot with little kiddos and they have these cute little valves that close when they're not breathing. And when they breathe in, it opens. So they get, all air is getting sucked in. Uh, nebulizers, you're gonna be able to nebulize now. We'll play with them and show you how to put those together. You hook them up, turn, connect them to the oxygen and it makes this nice little mist and they breathe in through their mouth and out through their nose until the medicine's all gone. And the point to that, if you're giving albuterol that way, it's all going into the lungs and not hitting the mouth. That's another way of getting all the medicine where it needs to go. Um, I think it's the IV bolus that you have to do for your skill test. They're not going to make you do that. The IO route, once you get that needle in there, you can hook your IV tubing right to it or an extension thing so you can give the shot directly into it. Um, or you can hook your IV fluid up and go directly there. They often recommend, I understand it's not in protocol here because I got told, what, you want me to do what? They say that needle going into the bone doesn't really hurt very much, but it's when you go to push anything into the bone, it hurts like heck. So they recommend the first thing you give is lidocaine, a little bit of lidocaine to numb that up so that you can go ahead and shoot the medicine in and it won't hurt them as bad. You're being called. And that's it for now. If you have questions between now and next, where are we at, Monday? I would like to do test two on Monday, which is going to cover the airway and the IVs, the advanced airways and IVs, what we've learned in between. I still need to get the second test of, for the first, second option for the first test for those of you who want to retake it and see if you do any better. I have not given you the numbers. This is what I plan to do today. These are the numbers I get to assign you so you can get your information online. And the day didn't pan out that way. I ended up about the time I sat down to do it, the pager went off and I ended up coming into town when there was a wild goose chase. And no wreck was found that was supposed to have happened. But from there, I went straight to the ball game. So hopefully tomorrow morning, I will get that done right away and get those to you so you can start studying the test and questions and things online. Uh, Regina already has. Have you been there yet? No, I have not yet. <laughs> See? No. So, test is on the advanced airways, airway period, and circulation stuff and IVs. Um, not the meds themselves, but there will be med there will be pharmacy Questions like, which of these is the generic name? Or which of these is a trade name? <clears throat> I'm going to say, what is the dose of nitroglycerin and how often can you give it? That's not going to be in this test. But anything that's in those chapters that we covered is fair game for the test. Okay, ready?
we're psyched, we're good to go. Uh, those of you who were attending online, if you're still there, please type your name in so I know who was here every time so I can do attendance. I know Regina's here because I can see her. I know Barb's here because I keep hearing her. Have a good night, Becky. Thank you. Dan. Thank you, Dan. And I will catch you all next week. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Record.